Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to talk just briefly, uh, do a quick introduction of criminological theory and kind of discuss what theory is, uh, what knowledge is, and what paradigms are, and how they're relevant in understanding why crime occurs and the pro progression of knowledge essentially. So let's get to it. A, a theory. What is a theory? A theory, it's a set of logically interrelated propositions used to explain an outcome. In criminal justice, we're really concerned with explaining why, why crime occurs, why victimization occurs, um, what factors are associated with it, those types of things. So uh, theory in and of itself is, is generally, it's philosophical in nature, it's rooted in that, but it, it also combines logic and um, good theories have a lot of different qualities associated with them. One of the most important qualities perhaps is whether or not it can be tested, tested empirically, tested in the real world, observed. And uh, uh, that way you can incorporate scientific method to test the theory and see if it's valid, if it helps with the progression of knowledge or not. So theory in of itself um, should drive research and it should drive knowledge to, to that degree. And, and that's within all fields. It's not just criminology or criminal justice, but um, it's, it's really, uh, it can be complex, but generally um, they're just a set of propositions used to explain an outcome. And it's more complex than a hypothesis, which is essentially just a causal statement, which just says that hanging out with uh, people who smoke marijuana is going to increase the likelihood that you smoke marijuana. So that's like a learning theory perspective. But it's more complex than that because there's different propositions, okay? Like that hanging out with delinquent peers is going to increase delinquency and exposure to definitions favorable to crime and imitation and all these other aspects associated with it. So it's a set of interrelated propositions used to explain an outcome. Um, from there, what underlies theory, right? It, it is knowledge, right? It's the development of knowledge. Why are we so intent on theory and criminology and in all fields, essentially, is to progress knowledge, to get to the betterment of society, to the betterment of humankind, right? So knowledge is really, um, is kind of complex and it's philosophical if you think about it as well. So it's what people create to symbolically represent reality. Uh, and reality can be more complex than that. It, and uh, if you take courses on philosophy, you'll, you can definitely really get into what reality is. So uh, there's various paradigms. So these are various perspectives over time. Um, schools of thought. So there's a pre-modern view in all simplicity of reality, a modern and a postmodern view. So from the pre-modern perspective, um, it assumes that people see things as they truly are, right? Uh, like if you look at a dandelion, it would be assumed that a dandelion is just a weed and that's just what it is, right? But from the modern perspective, there's a, a diversity of views as legitimate, considered to be legitimate. So some people might think it's a a nasty weed, that dandelion, but other people might, well, it's a, it's a flower, and it is a beautiful flower, and all these things. What becomes problematic for science and the progression of knowledge through testing things empirically in a scientific method type of way is the postmodern perspective, because it, it assumes that we cannot step outside of our hum, human selves to see an objective reality, to see things how they really truly are, right? So in a pre-modern view, let's take another example. Uh, murder is wrong, right? If you kill somebody, it's wrong all the time. From a modern perspective, well, it could be there are perhaps situations where murder could be justified. Legally, certainly, but morally, perhaps even even so, right? If, if you see somebody being assaulted or stabbed and you have, happen to have a, a gun on you and you shoot the person that's stabbing the other individual, well, perhaps that's morally justifiable, right? In the postmodern view, there's no objective reality to be had, right? It's just a series of events, and nobody can step outside of their, their past to actually analyze the situation for what it is. All right? Um, so the progression of knowledge. So reality underlies knowledge. That's why I got into reality. It's what people create to symbolically represent reality. And we're consider, concerned with moving forward with knowledge, and that's where theory comes into play. So historically and through the progression of humankind, um, explanations for events tend to unfold in this type of dynamic, right? There's the theological or supernatural explanations for an event 
metaphysical or philosophical, and then it progresses on to scientific scientific explanations. So theological. So let's say uh, an example of this would be you know in a volcano were erupting. Uh, hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, if the volcano is erupting, perhaps the gods or somebody is not happy with you, or perhaps a tornado comes through and, and tears down everything, ruins your farm, right? Well, God's not happy with me. I'm not saying this is right or wrong, good or bad, or any of that. I'm not trying to place any value judgments on that, anybody's belief system. But anyways, from there, uh, there's more philosophical explanations. Perhaps there's plates or there's a molten core inside the earth's crust and and that's what causes the volcano and perhaps these high winds and this cold front meets a high pressure system and there's a tornado right and a scientific explanation would be to incorporate this met this metaphysical philosophical explanation with empiricism with empirical assessment so that's what science essentially is is combining rational explanation with empiricism, with methodology. So we can test that. We can see if the conditions are just right in the atmosphere uh, with a low pressure and a high pressure system connecting and then the, the winds, um, you know, trying to escape so quickly and then you have a tornado. I'm not a meteorologist, but something of that degree, right? So it's the idea that you can actually observe it and combine it with logical explanation. And that's innately underlying what is the progression of knowledge. And theories help evolve knowledge as well. So theories themselves tend to operate in paradigms. So as I, I kind of touched on briefly before, the pre-modern, modern, and post-modern eras of reality, those are different paradigms, collective schools of thoughts, and it's an implicit body of intertwined theoretical and methodological belief that permits selection, evaluation, and criticism. Essentially, it's a collective school of thought, right? Uh, it's, it's a collective agreement. Um, in, in the social sciences, paradigms aren't necessarily that defined, but there are some big events that have occurred over time. If you want to look into more what paradigms are and the progression of knowledge and all that, I, I would highly recommend looking at Karl, Pop, Cop, Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn and their works and their arguments on the progression of scientific knowledge. But anyways, so uh, going back to criminology and criminal justice, there are kind of paradigms, uh, but nothing is like that fixed. In other sciences, there might be a paradigm where the earth is flat, right? So within that idea that the earth is flat, every theory that is developed is based on that assumption that the earth is flat. So if I drive my boat over the ocean, I'm going to fall off into a big hole right? That's essentially, or if I dig deep enough, because the earth is flat, I'll fall through and, and be into nothingness, all right? Um, so once that paradigm shifts and changes, then all those theories tend to become irrelevant, right, at that point in time. So once we figure out the earth isn't flat, that it's actually round, you can sail your boat all the way around the thing, that you'll be okay. Well, if you're still operating on their assumptions, if I sail my boat, across the Pacific, I'm falling off into a black hole, you're, you're probably operating under some irrelevant assumptions that aren't really beneficial, right? And I know people out there believe there's flat earthers and stuff, but it's irrelevant, right? Or, or that the earth is the center of the universe, that the sun revolves around the earth, right? So you have theories attached to that. But once you figure out that, hey, the earth actually revolves around the sun, we're not the center of the universe, and all these other factors that come into play, Things have to change. Knowledge progresses forward, and society pro progresses forward. And people operating under those old assumptions, they're antiquated perspectives and perhaps a waste of time. All right. Um, but within the social sciences, things aren't that fixed. All right, because there's a lot of gray area, and people have different opinions and different perspectives and different things. And all right, uh, and, and it's not that uh, cut and dry. It's not a flat Earth. It's not the sun revolves around the earth or all these types of things. So within criminology, um, prior to the 1700s around, that was a significant, signi significant period of time for Western, uh, Western cultures, Western societies, European societies, and all those types of things. So uh, up until that point, theological or supernatural uh, explanations were generally given 
all right, uh, to why people are criminal, why people are going out there assaulting people, why people are out there robbing and stealing and doing all these bad things and raping people and all these and pillaging. Uh, all right, there's demons, there's witches, all these explanations, right? You look at remember Salem witch trials and all these things that occurred. Um, but in the 1700s, something significant happened. A lot of philosophical development occurred, and it's called generally referred to the Age of Enlightenment, 1700s, 1800s, uh, the Constitution, all these things that underlie it, right? The idea that this classical perspective comes into criminology, comes into play. And the main assumption there is that people aren't possessed by demons or evil. Um, they have free will. And that's why they're committing crimes, right? That's why they're out there stealing stuff and robbing people and, and, and assaulting people and shooting people, right? They have free will. They're innately greedy. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, Cesar Becker, Beccaria, or Beccaria, uh, you know, in, in their perspectives, like humans have free will. And today, most people probably still subscribe to that uh, type of mentality, at least within the American society, right? And that's generally what our society is based on. I'll get into that in a little bit as well, our criminal justice system. So in the 1800s, uh, you start to see a shift, a shift in the paradigm towards a more positivist perspective, that there's a predetermined, right? There's like a, met, like, it's like a medical model. So people have a biological or a psychological or a genetic predisposition to crime. Um, and that's when you see uh, uh, Lombroso and his theory of optimism and optimistic traits. And, and these types of deals start to, to pop up. And, and psychology starts to appear in all these things, right? And The Discovery of the Asylum, that's a good book as well. You should go check that out. Uh, start, asylums start popping up everywhere in the United States, right, to address that. Now, in the 1920s, you start to see a shift back towards classical perspective. And... It, while essentially including aspects of the positivist perspective that people have essentially limited free will. That you have free will, but it's limited. It's limited on biological, psychological factors, um, genetic factors perhaps, or sociological factors, right? So this is kind of what the paradigms look like, right? So we're more interested in these three. There's more in the 1960s you could look at and call them critical paradigms, critical thoughts. Uh, more Marxist takes, more uh, feminist takes, and all these different things start to pop up as well. But all these perspectives are still relevant. So there is no cut and dry. It's not a flat earth, then we discover that it's round, or that the sun, actually, we revolve around the sun. It's not that cut and dry within social sciences, but certainly not in criminology or sociology, all right? Because all these theories are still relevant today to some degree. But within a classical perspective, the main assumption is people have free will. So these theories are based on that. The theory of deterrence, what the criminal justice system in this country is based upon, is, is essentially based upon, is, is the idea that people have free will. So we can make a criminal justice system that's swift, severe, and has a level of certainty of being caught for any crimes. And that should deter people from committing crime, right? Because uh, they have free will. And once you make a free will honest assessment about, hey, uh, the punishment is going to, the harm from the punishment is going to exceed the benefit I get from committing the crime. Well, then the individual should be deterred, essentially. Rational choice, that's based on more of an economic model. And that's more recent, all right? People invest in the stock market when it's low, try to get it on the high, right? And sell it on the high. Positivism, you see the biological theories, trait theories, psychological theories. That comes around in the 1850s and 1920s. Kind of faded away there. Uh, technology wasn't necessarily advanced enough. Certainly has come back to the forefront over the last 10, 20 years uh, with advances in medical technology and all these types of things to really discuss crime, uh, right? And because we can start to assess things adequately, biological and, and genetic coding and all these different things that have come about. And then the neoclassical, all these different perspectives that have come around since the 1920s from the Chicago school um, through essentially through the early 2000s. Uh, the control theories, the strain theories, and all the development that has occurred. So that's kind of the progression of knowledge, and that's really what I wanted to touch upon. And then that's kind of gets why theory is important. So there is a shift into scientific explanations, and that generally occurs within all fields. So that's what we've talked about today, the theory. Uh, it's a set of logically interrelated propositions used to explain an outcome. It can be complex. Uh, simplicity is good within theories, but they need to be testable, 
right? So you can empirically evaluate them in some capacity, right? And really what theories do is help progress knowledge. And what underlies knowledge is the idea of reality. And there's different perspectives of reality. So if you take all this and look backwards towards theory, reality, and knowledge, and know that they underlie what theory is and theory progression, well, there's error that's going to occur because people can't really get outside them objective, their subjective selves to look at reality for what it actually is. And that can be problematic for science. All right. And paradigms, uh, they're collective schools of thought. And really, theories tend to operate within paradigms, and paradigms offer assumptions. So it's good to have a good little foreground base, baseline knowledge of what's going on here. And hopefully this video is some benefit to you guys. So take care, all right?